Welcome back to Five Questions on the YouTube and podcast homes for BamaOnline.com. Travis Schreier, Senior Analyst for BOL, this time joined by Senior Writer Charlie Potter, has been a longtime staple of our Crimson Tide coverage right there at BOL. You ready for five questions, Charlie, as Alabama prepares for Saturday night's matchup with Mississippi State on the road? Yeah, looking forward to it. I was actually thinking about doing something similar to this today. When you texted me, I was like, I guess we're on the same wavelength. So I uh, went ahead and just saved it for the podcast. So it should be a fun one. Yeah, we've kind of been uh... – We've been tuned up to each other for a while now, seeing as how, what, the last decade plus we've yeah. been colleagues here at BamaOnline.com, so I guess that shouldn't come as a surprise. But we'll go ahead and get these going, Charlie, and we'll start with this. On the offensive side of the ball for the Crimson Tide, given the second-half performance that we saw from UA and the win over Ole Miss last Saturday, do you believe the offense, this offense, is on the verge of settling into its true identity? I think it's definitely on its way. Um, you know, I, I think we saw really in the entirety of the game um, some stuff catered more toward uh, Jalen Milrow, and, and that might be uh, because you know he was named the starter. Nick Saban came out and, and did that last week before the game, uh, kind of a surprise mood, at least from a, an announcement standpoint. But um, you know, Alabama has always done a good job of um, just catering to his player strengths, and we saw some more design runs for Milrow. I think that's needed. I think they need to continue to get some play action passes and things like that to get him comfortable and then open up some of those deep shots that he's been really good at. So I think outside of the, the interception in the first half, I thought Milrow played pretty well. Um, you know, I don't really fault him on the, the fourth or the first and one um, snap through snap that we saw, but I think the offense really started to lean on the run game a little bit more. Um, and then, like you said, sort of, show the identity I think we may be expected in game one. So now that they kind of have things straightened out from a personnel standpoint, maybe we'll see more of that and see them be more comfortable. And like Nick Saban said, not shooting themselves in the foot near as much as they did in the first half. Yeah, five offensive touchdowns, right, gone by the boards due to penalty. So that would certainly help Alabama in its current statistical ranking among SEC teams in scoring offense. When you think about those opportunities that – were lost and really the last two second halves, the last two weeks. And you could even say the third quarter against Texas, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's taken this unit a while to get going, but then in the third quarter, that's when we've seen some of its very best work, especially with Jalen Milrow behind center. And I do, I said it right after the game last Saturday, I felt like that was a blueprint second half in general for Alabama. Play to your strengths on offense, as you outlined run the football, Jace McClellan 100 yards against Ole Miss. It was Roydell Williams the week before. We did see a little bit of an expansion where the design quarterback run game is concerned. I'd like to see even more for Jalen Milrow. Um, but certainly the deep shots that you saw in the second half with Jermaine Burton once again uh, making an explosive play from Jalen Milrow. And then Jalen Hale, the true freshman, stepping up big there against Ole Miss. That was a welcomed sight as well. Let's go to the defensive side of the ball for our next question, Charlie. And I'm going to ask it as crazy as it sounds, considering that four of the guys from last year made NFL rosters from the Alabama secondary in 2022. That being said, is this Alabama secondary four games into the 2023 campaign is it playing even at a higher level than the one that preceded it four games into last season? I think it's definitely on its way to doing that. Um, heck, I, I remember being in New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl and talking to uh, Jordan Battle, and he kind of said the same thing, that with what they have coming back, that he thinks that they could be even better because you have guys just with more experience. I think – for me, it starts with consistency at cornerback because, yes, you have Kool-Aid McKinstry back, and he's one of the best in the country, but it's it's been the Terry and Arnold show in terms of just he's been, from start to finish, the guy opposite of Kool-Aid, and he's played well. Um, you know, he's now um, up to three passes defended. He has a couple – or that's just this past week he had three passes defended with two breakups and interception, and uh, he's tied for the SEC lead in that category in pass breakups. So he's a guy that's been – more comfortable, I think more confident. And 
just that consistency of not kind of rotating players uh, at that spot opposite of Kool-Aid, I think has helped. Um, you know, it, it, it's never ideal to lose a talent like Brian Branch and, and Jordan Battle and DeMarco Helms played a ton of football for Alabama. But getting Malachi Moore back, you know, he's been the signal caller of the defense. I thought he's played really well through the first four weeks. And then you have another veteran presence in Jalen Key. While he's new to the program, he's not new to college football. And Caleb Downs has played really well, too. He's had a couple of, of um, you know, freshman moments, but he's been as advertised. So I think – when you look at that group as a whole, just in terms of their kind of mixture of experience and talent, I think it's well on its way to being a better and improved secondary than what we saw last year. Yeah, I think you got to kind of take it in pieces, right? I would say corner play is definitely improved over where yeah. it was at this point a year ago, simply because, as you talked about, Terry and Arnold continues to grow in leaps and bounds, even from the Texas performance a couple of weeks ago where he had two or three penalties, two on defense, one on special teams. But Nick Saban talked about it earlier in the week. Just seems as if he trusts himself more. It's as if they had a talk with him and said, look at this tape. You're in great shape on these plays. Trust mm -hmm. yourself. Don't feel like you need to grab at the moment of truth. Um, play clean. And he's done that in the last two games. Now, you know, some of this too, we're still waiting to see. And I think we will see. Uh, as the stakes go up, although we also heard earlier today about some significant injury news involving the quarterback situation at Texas A&M. But even with that, Max Johnson's going to be a veteran guy that's going to jump in there and prove formidable, I think. But yeah, I'd say the corner plays definitely better. I don't think Alabama's really lost anything as of yet at the star position, as crazy as that sounds, because Brian Branch is a rookie for the Lions, is playing out of his mind already. Uh, and he played great throughout the 2022 season. But that just kind of illustrates how good Malachi Moore has been through four games. And then at the safety spots, uh, you said it about Downs. He's had a few freshman moments, but he's been rock solid otherwise. And I think it's only going to get better as Jalen Key gets healthier and healthier. I thought we saw more of that last week. Um, you did see Ole Miss go after him a little bit there in the second half in some matchups, but I think it has a chance, certainly in the not too distant future, to be overall uh, certainly on par with what we saw a year ago, if not playing at an even higher level. Let's get back to the offensive side of the ball, Charlie, and let's talk about Jalen Milrow because this is his first road start coming up at Mississippi State on Saturday night. With that being said, what is your confidence level in Milrow as he takes this show on the road? Yeah, I think looking back at that Arkansas game last year, I know he obviously didn't start that, but he, he finished pretty strongly. Now, you look at the numbers, you know, he only attempted nine passes. He completed four of them. Uh, heck, Alabama in the game only completed 11, and that was with Bryce Young attempting 13 of those. But um, I, I think if if they can do what we were talking about earlier and just kind of follow that second-half script from the Ole Miss game, I think they'll be fine. Um, I think if they can lean on – Jace McClellan and Wade Williams. Heck, we might even see Justice Haynes in the first half because now we know that Jam Miller's going to have to sit that first two quarters after the the targeting penalty. So lean on your run game. Uh, do what you were doing that second half. I think that's going to help Jalen Miller out tremendously because you look at Mississippi State, and while Nick Saban's been pretty complimentary of the physicality and the aggressiveness that the Bulldogs play with on defense, I think I wrote it down over here. They're, they're 10th in the SEC in terms of rush defense, giving up over 125 yards a game. You look at the three games Alabama's won, and once they get over that 125-yard clip, those are the three wins. You know, they're obviously the, the outlier being the Texas game. So if they can run the ball and then, you know, open things up down the field uh, vertically like they have for Jalen Miller, I, th I think they'll be okay. Now, it's going to be loud. Starkville's a, a unique place. Um, but, you know, Fayetteville's not an easy place to play either, and he did – some pretty good things there in the second half a year ago. So I think if they can have good communication up from the offensive line, if he can get the offense lined up and in the right alignment, I, I think they'll be you know pretty good because this isn't – these aren't world beaters in Starkville. You know, Alabama should win this game. But I think with the comfortability and the confidence that, that Jalen Milrow has, if he has those things and, you know, Tommy Reese dials up a good game for him, I, I think this offense can see success. Yeah, I think my confidence level, however high it is in Milrow going into this game, probably has more to do with people around him 
because the receivers have played at such a high level through four games. I mean, they have made some plays for Jalen Milrow. And give Jalen credit. He's given his guys opportunities to make them. But still, you talk about Jermaine Burton and the explosive plays he's helped create. You saw it last week with Hale going up there in the second half and winning uh, on a ball with two defenders in the neighborhood. So I, I like that. I like the receivers. I like the tight ends after last week, too, because we saw mm -hmm. it from C.J. Dupree and Robbie Oots, not just Amari Nyblack. So more guys that can certainly help him when he does throw the football. I like the running back position where they're at right now after the last two weeks. The offensive line, I thought, was better against Ole Miss. So, And when I look at this state defense, you pretty much hit on it. Not very good. And a defense that quarterbacks like – Spencer Rattler and like Jaden Daniels have been able to take advantage of certainly on the back end and you, know, you worry for Alabama a little bit when it comes to pass rush and protection I think more of that this week will be centralized on uh, states inside linebackers uh, Nathaniel Watson and Jet Johnson Zach Arnett and that defense are not afraid to dial those guys up uh, but I don't think edge pressure should be as much of a problem this week as it has been for for Alabama at times as we know so more than anything, I like Jalen Milrow in this game because, well, I like some of the extenuating circumstances involved in that matchup. As we move back to the defense, Charlie, I want to ask you this one. With Deontay Lawson uh, certainly up in the air where his availability is concerned, how will those positions play out, you think, this week in Starkville? Yeah, that's something that's going to be interesting to follow because kind of heard, at least I have, kind of conflicting things of the severity of it. So, you know, that might be something the Nick Saban updates later today after practice. But um, if he can't go, I, I tried to ask this question Monday and, and he didn't really answer it. I was looking for who was going to be the signal caller of the defense if Deontay can't play. And, you know, he mentioned that they went with primarily Jihad Campbell and, and Trez Marshall, um, you know, last week against Ole Miss. And we saw that. Um, we also saw some Kendrick Blackshire mixed in there. I think that they could go with a rotation. You know, we've seen a healthy mix of, of all of those guys at the inside linebacker position with Lawson being kind of the stalwart there. But uh, I think Jihad Campbell played well this past week. I think he had seven tackles. And uh, he's a guy, we've talked about it before, just the range that he has is something you like to have in the middle of your defense, especially because you know, Marshall and, and Blackshire, while they've shown some good things, they're not quite as 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 quick and aggressive as maybe – um, you know, Jihad and, and Deontay. Now, watch how he hits you. I think that he's a guy that has made progress, but you, what Jihad brings or what Kendrick brings from an athleticism standpoint um, and an aggressiveness standpoint, you know, Trez makes up for an experience and knowledge of the defense. So those two, it's, it's kind of just pick your poison for that for me. But I think Jihad Campbell is certainly someone that could benefit from, um, you know, Deontay being maybe sidelined this weekend, but we'll see what happens. You know, Nick Saban, after the game on Saturday, called this ankle sprain a pretty good one, and that's usually an indicator of where things stand. But we'll see if he's able to go. That's probably going to be – I can almost guess what he's going to say tonight, that it's a you know day-to-day. -day, he's been able to do some things, but we'll see. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think if State were still an air raid offense, it might be an easier diagnosis or – a kind of forecast for what we would see if Deontay can't go in this game because we talked about it, as you said, Jihad Campbell would make a lot of sense against an offense like that that wants to kind of spread you out and make you make plays in space. Uh, that certainly fits his skill set to a T. But this Mississippi State offense now has the SEC second leading rusher in Woody Mark. So you're going to have to account for some things between the tackles and in the run game and more of an, a committed approach to that uh, with what we're seeing from State under Zach Arnett. So I still think Campbell would be one of those two guys. I think he checks those every down type of boxes based on his physical attributes. Uh, but you are still going to need some thump this week, I think. You're still yep. going to need some Trez Marshall and potentially Kendrick Blackshire as well. And we talk about the road game for Alabama this week and kind of the the thing that comes to mind immediately when you think about Davis Wade Stadium is cowbells Charlie so I'm going to ask you this as we wrap up our five questions for Mississippi State week what do you think is more annoying for opposing fan bases 
Cowbells for 60 minutes or Rocky Top in Knoxville on a loop? I mean, even if your team is hammering Tennessee and Knoxville, still going to play Rocky Top. So uh, what's, what's your pick there? For the fan base, I'd probably lean toward Rocky Top, um, especially after last year's game in Knoxville. I think that one is certainly one that they would pick. From my standpoint, it's a little different because the the stadium and the press box setting is so different because at Tennessee, you're up in the clouds. It's a closed press box. You have to kind of lower your computer down and lean forward to even see the field sometimes. So you hear it, but it's not just deafening. Now in Starkville, uh, you're a little closer to the field. It's an open air press box and you hear them, you know, I get to the game three hours before it starts and they're, they're playing it even then. So you hear them then and you hear them all the way up until you come out of that post game press conference, because I, I've never seen an Alabama team lose in Mississippi state. So you don't really hear them afterwards. So for me, I would say the cowbells because it's open air and it's your ears are literally ringing because of the bells. But um yeah, they do. They play the hell out of Rocky Top, and so much so that you know you'll be sitting there post game writing, and I've got myself humming the song just because it's been in your head on a loop for the past three hours. So I get both sides of it. I think fans would probably side more with with Rocky Top, but for me, yeah, man, those I think Jaheim Otis said it best yesterday. Those Cowboys are pretty annoying. They are, and I'm with you though. I'm willing to pay that price for an open air press box because they're becoming more and more precious aren't they yeah remember yeah, they five six even seven years ago a lot of stadiums around college football were open air they weren't totally enclosed like they are in knoxville and some other places uh nowadays even alabama you know before they moved the media had that ability to open up the press box over there on the west side of bryant denny stadium and you think about sort of sec traditions and I was considering this earlier today. I wanted to get your thoughts on this as well. You've been around the SEC like I have. Some really cool things that maybe transpire in visiting or opposing SEC stadiums during the course of a game. You know, I think about South Carolina with the Space Odyssey 2001 entry uh, that the team makes there in Columbia. And then also Sandstorm. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. annoying are awesome. I've been kind of between on both. I think it depends on maybe how some of those games have gone for Alabama over there uh, at South Carolina. I'll tell you some of the newer ones I really like. I like I won't back down in Gainesville. We experienced that a couple of years ago, right? In between mm-hmm. the third and the fourth quarters now at Florida, they play the Tom Petty song, the, the Gainesville native Tom Petty. I won't back down in the entire 90,000 in attendance sing along to that. It's pretty much a, a goosebump moment, I would say. And then Colin Baton Rouge, man, whatever you think of LSU, when they crank that up at Death Valley and the pregame or before kickoff, uh, that's a pretty cool one, too. I don't know. Maybe you've got one or two you would add to that list. No, that last one's exactly when you were kind of talking about South Carolina, because I've been to Carolina and Florida only once uh, each. But I was immediately drawn to, to Baton Rouge because those games have been so big and the crowds have been so electric because Alabama comes to town. It's a, it's a huge it's a huge game anytime. But uh, those Alabama LSU battles have been really fun to cover. And yeah, when that song comes on, it's it's pretty electric. And I mean, heck, those are night games. Those fans of Baton Rouge are already hammered, so <laughs> it's it's already a good time. But. Yeah, that one comes to mind. And it is a shame because you mentioned those press boxes, like the one in Tuscaloosa is closed. And there'll be times, not in Tuscaloosa, but you'll be other places like A&M. You're up in the clouds. It's closed. There'll be times that stuff happens and maybe, you know, you're sitting there cranking out your story for after the game and you might miss something just because you don't hear it as much. So having those open air press boxes and getting to experience that game day atmosphere and the traditions it's um, it's almost a blessing now because they're going away with the the press box moving and closing up. Yeah, yeah. Auburn's press Auburn. box is awful. I know we're not going to. And it other, was great. Other teams. It was great yeah. when it was open air at Jordan. Auburn's Auburn's entire media setup is awful. Um, Ole Miss's is awful. But there's there are some stadiums that have that open air press box, and you can hear and experience those traditions. And heck, even the flyovers. That's a special moment in games. But uh, outside of Tuscaloosa, yeah, it's, it's tough to beat a, a night game in Baton Rouge. Yeah, Florida's isn't great in terms of where you're kind of situated. It almost feels like you're sitting on the concourse 
watching yeah. games there at Florida Field, but you still get the experience of the the full deal because you are out in the elements uh, for the most part. You're covered. You're sheltered from the weather, thankfully, at that place, especially in September. But uh, absolutely, I think we could do an entire podcast on this. In fact, you've got that guitar back there. Maybe you could play a couple of these songs for us. <laughs> that, you know, that's uh, that's probably pretty dusty. That's that's a guitar I got when I was a teenager, still hanging up from the parents. I had one. I couldn't tell you the last time I picked that thing up. You and Clint Lamb with your guitars, you know, in the backgrounds. <laughs> We're gonna have to get you guys together, do a little duet for us or something, because uh, I got to hear something. Uh, but we'll talk music another time with you, Charlie. <laughs> For now, we'll stick to football for the most part. And, of course, you're going to find all of Charlie's great work for us right there at BamaOnline.com. Come hang out with us on the roundtable. The premium message board of choice for Alabama fans around the globe. And, of course, we've got our new YouTube channel, which you're watching this on, I got to think. And if you haven't subscribed, you should do that right now as well. Turn on those notifications. You'll get all of our video content as it drops to the YouTube home for BamaOnline.com. And of course, we're always going to have the Bama Online podcast as well. If you would check that out, leave us a rating and a review after you hit the subscribe button there. That too would be greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Yeah, man. Always good to catch up. For Charlie Potter, Travis Ryer, thanking you once again for joining us for five questions right here on the YouTube and podcast homes for BamaOnline.com. And until next time, so long, everybody.